everybody. Looks like we've got a good crowd. Uh, I'm Scott Snyder, Dean of the College of Science and Engineering. Miriam, is my audio okay? It sounds like it's, it's working well on my end. Okay, super. Thanks. And thanks to everybody for being here. I see some familiar faces and also a lot of, of new or at least not so familiar faces. Um, we started this out as a effort to reach out to COSY faculty and graduate students. And then word kind of got out and um, thanks to uh, the Dean of Education and to the Vice President for Research, we expanded uh, our reach. So I hope that this day is useful for you. And I look forward to spending some time with you uh, this afternoon. So with that, I'm going to introduce uh, Miriam Dance, who works here in the Dean's Office in the College of Science and Engineering, uh, to kind of lay out the logistics of today. And then we'll move forward. Thanks, Scott. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Miriam Dance, as Scott mentioned. And for today's meeting, you will have an opportunity to ask questions after the presentations. So to streamline the flow of questions, the chat has been set up so that rather than having the questions sent to the group as a whole, all questions should be sent to me through the Zoom chat feature. Just select my name, Miriam Dance, in the blue box above the chat field and your questions will go directly to me and I will add these instructions to the chat as well. You don't need to wait until the presentations end before submitting your questions, so please feel free to send them my way at any time. And that's it. So Scott, I will hand it back to you. All right, excellent. Um, I will give you, I'm gonna not, I'm, I'm mostly gonna let people talk. I'm gonna use a slide deck, but I will just share the screen very, very quickly. Um, and again, as Miriam, Miriam said, perhaps the most important thing is that if you have questions, please type them in right away. I hate to, I, I like a more of an informal exchange, but with Zoom, it just doesn't work very well in my experience. So what you can see is we're gonna to talk to Dave Harris here, then Fred Parrish, and I'm going to spend quite a bit of time, not quite a bit, it, I, I will make it brief, but I will spend some time going through some of my experiences, which I'll tell you about here in a bit. Uh, and then we will be happy to do questions and answers uh, at the end. So with that, um, I'd like to introduce Dave Harris. He runs our sponsor programs and support shop here at ISU. Dave is awesome. And he can tell you a little bit about himself and his shop and, uh, we'll, and, and what sponsored programs does. And then we'll go from there. So Dave, I'm gonna just stop the share so you can maybe see people a little bit better uh, for those who are live and, and then I'll go back on when we need to. Great. Thanks, Scott. Um, as Scott mentioned, I'm Dave Harris. Uh, I've been at Idaho State University oh, geez, for 28 years now. Um, and I've been in the Office for Research since the year 2000. And I've worked in the capacity of a grants and sponsored program specialist, uh, associate director, assistant director, um, director of uh, sponsored programs, and then now currently with uh, assistant vice president for research. And I oversee the sponsored programs operation, which includes uh, the pre-award services, uh, sponsored programs, uh, proposal submission, all that kind of stuff, as well as grant accounting, uh, which would be, you know, once you get the award and the, uh, the, the execution and, and the expenditure part of the award. And so, so with that, it's kind of a, it really helps us provide a, a one-stop shop for faculty members to, to you know, from, the, from finding a funding source all the way through uh, proposal development, um, award, uh, award acceptance, um, subcontract negotiation, and then ultimately. Miriam, there we go. Dave, you, Dave, I'm sorry, you got muted somehow inadvertently. Okay, there. sorry about that. So, no, no, no. That's I think it was a mistake on our end. So just um, 
you may want to you may want to stop step back for a moment. Well, that's that's okay because now I've got a chance to to refine it a little bit. So so I, I'm not sure what happened there, but as Scott mentioned, I'm Dave Harris, and I'm I'm uh, uh, with the uh, Office for Research and specifically this uh, Office of Sponsored Programs and Support. And so our uh, operation oversees the, the external funding opportunities and, and the submission of proposals, as well as the acceptance of awards um, and the execution of the award with regards to the financial aspect of it. So the expenditure part of it and everything like that. Um, you know, our office also oversees the internal grants um, and, and the internal grant funding uh, and, and the two mechanisms that we have to distribute that that, in, that internal grant funding. And so as you'll see with the slide that's shared right now, um, we, you know, our office deals with funding opportunities, the proposal development and submission. Um, and I'll get into each of these a little bit more detail. Uh, award acceptance, subcontract negotiation, and, and, and uh, subcontract negotiation and, and subcontract development even. Um, Post-award accounting, which would be through the grant accounting uh, part of our operation, as well as the internal grants that I mentioned. And so let's just see how to get it to the next step, slide because it's giving me fits. So here's a real, a real quick um, flow chart of, of our of our uh, of our operation with regards to um, you know start to finish finding the funding sources, um, helping you find those funding sources, as well as dissemination of, of funding sources. We try to target those those um, funding sources and the dissemination of those funding sources so that we're not just blasting information out to faculty and, and clogging up your inbox, but but more try to target it to specific interest and and making sure that that what we send out, um, uh, you know, is really hopefully applicable to what what you have going. We've got numerous um, mechanisms that we utilize, um, you know, obviously we utilize email, but we also subscribe to Grant Forward, which is a, a service that that we can create a profile for you and, and in that profile. Uh, it, it actually auto searches once a week and sends out any new opportunities to you. And it auto searches um, utilizing your keywords that you entered in and possibly, you know, a brief white paper about your research. And then it, it uh, automatically disseminates those directly to you. So then we also have, like I mentioned, well, so once we've got that funding source to you, uh, preparing a proposal for submission um, and then actually submitting it, Ideally, we'll get that award and we'll help you set up that award and manage that award. And then there'd be the closeout. And so uh, <clears throat> with regards to pre-award services, like I mentioned, we have the finding the funding sources. Um, uh, Steve Wright and Mackenzie Smith are both uh, grants and sponsored program specialists within the office. They work closely with each other and they'll work closely with uh, faculty and staff to find that funding source as well as help develop that proposal off of that funding source. Um, our office oversees limited submission competitions. And those would be the ones that, that, um, uh, that come along like the NSF uh, MRI major research instrumentation program, the NEH summer stipend, those that, that, are, that have limited numbers of submissions that we can make on behalf of the university. Um, Steve and McKinsey also work with the faculty members um, with regards to proposal development. Now, this is primarily um, budget development and interpretation of the guidelines. Um, we feel like, and, and faculty and staff in the past have felt like they're the subject matter expert. And so they're the ones that really come up with the meat of the proposal and, and, and whatnot. But our office can assist certainly with the proposal development and the budget development and the interpretation of the guidelines. Uh, you know, what the certain clause in the guideline might mean or how you um, would go about answering a question. The one thing that's always key, and I think Scott can, uh, will touch base on this uh, a little bit later is, is that you know, the vast majority of the funding that is awarded is, a, is awarded to PIs that make the effort to contact the program officer. And so that's, that's a key, we've seen that be key um, uh, with regards to uh, proposal success. And then you'll see also proposal uh, routing and approval. Uh, <clears throat> that's through our Cayuse system. Cayuse has been live on campus since 2014. We ask for, uh, for five working days prior to the agency deadline, the sponsoring agency deadline, for us to be able to review and work back and forth with the faculty member to, to submit that proposal uh, and make sure that, that, that you know, all the I's are dotted and the T's are crossed and everything like that. 
Um, our, our people are available to help with Cayuse at any, at any point along the way. And that could be um, creating the proposal in Cayuse for you, or it could be simply answering questions and, and, and mentoring or, or uh, shepherding that proposal along as, as it goes through the routing process. Keep in mind that, that um, uh, proposals are submitted on, uh, by ISU on behalf of the PI and that, that, um, and that any award that's made is made um, uh, to Idaho State University you know, on behalf of the PI. And this becomes important because when we start talking about um, accepting an award, you know, Idaho State University accepts those awards, not necessarily the PI. And that's, that's realistically um, uh, uh, more of a, of a protection to the PI because of, of, of the, we don't want you to ex assume the liability and responsibility of, of accepting that award and all of the, the, all that it entails with regards to making sure that the accounting is done correctly and making sure that, you know, the research outreach and compliance, which I'll touch on real briefly in just a sec. So keep that in mind that uh, the proposals are submitted by Idaho State University on behalf of the PI and awards are accepted by ISU. And then um, as, it, as we go on there, the, the funding award and negotiation um, and then acceptance, um, you know, they're reviewed by uh, uh, Patty Spots, who is our director of research contracts. And we'll try to negotiate out if, if something comes in a, in a contract or, a, or an agreement, we'll try to negotiate out any roadblocks or items that we can't live with, such as um, clauses that would make it cumbersome to get our, to get our research done or to even to conduct our research. Uh, one of the one of the ones that we see on a regular basis is, you know, maybe a funding agency mentions that they want monthly reports, and and you know we recognize that, that a PI has more to do than file, you know, a, a brief report every month. We'd rather see that quarterly or or, or even biannually or annually. Um, so little things like that that we would work with um, with you as the PI and and the funding agency to negotiate out. Um, and then keep in mind that awards um, are only signed by ISU. Uh, by ISU personnel that are designated as the authorized organization representative, which is the AOR. And at this point, um, awards um, for, well, let me back up for proposals. I'm designated as the AOR, so I can sign all proposals that go in uh, and most documents that go in. Patty, as the director of research contracts, can sign uh, smaller awards up to $250,000, or then at that point, they go to the vice president of research um, to review and, and sign off. And so um, those, the, the awards can only be signed by an AOR um, designee. And then we go on to our post award services, which realistically are our grants and contracts accounting. Uh, Lisa Wood is the director of grants and contracts accounting. Uh, <clears throat> they're there to, to help you with award setup, uh, tracking expenditures, invoicing of the agency. They'll handle all that, but they'll work with you as a, as a, as a PI or your financial staff in your college or, or uh, department. And then they also deal with award closeout. One thing that I mentioned on the first slide, which I, I'll touch on here, is, is the Office for Research and Sponsored Programs also um, oversees the internal grant program at ISU. Uh, the internal grants are managed by the Office for Research, but and they're funded by reinvesting our uh, recovered facilities and administrative costs. That 42% that, that um, uh, gets tacked on to federal federal proposals and, and subsequent awards um, for research projects, you know, there, that comes back and it's, it's, uh, it's distributed out uh, according to a predetermined formula that, that the university has. And a portion of the, uh, of the amount that comes back to the Office for Research goes to fund um, our internal grants every year. And since uh, fiscal 14, the, the Office for Research with the assistance of the Research Council has awarded nearly five or $1.5 million in internal grant awards. Um, currently, we have two, op or two uh, grant programs in place, internal grant programs, the seed grant program, which is up to, up to $20,000, and the internal small grant program, which is uh, up to $5,000. Uh, we seek the assistance of the Research Council. They review all of the proposals that are submitted, and then uh, members of the Research Council review those proposals depending upon the, uh, their area of expertise so that we really feel like we're getting um, uh, peers uh, reviewing their proposals. And that takes me to our, just I wanted to touch real briefly on the Research Outreach and Compliance Office. Um, Dr. Deb Easterly oversees that office. And that would be the office that you, that you deal with, whether it's funded research or not. 
that you deal with when it, when we when we're talking about animal use or human subjects or um, the the list goes on conflict conflict of interest in sponsored programs research misconduct responsible conduct of research controlled substances biosafety unmanned um, unmanned aerial um, systems as well as um, research compliance um, and uh, and actually the research outreach excuse me. Um, you know, with with regards to the undergraduate research program, diversity in STEM, um, and so Deb and her staff oversee oversee that uh, that aspect of the Office for Research. And with that, that's the end of where I wanted to end up. And and um, because I do understand that Fred's going to talk a little bit more about the post award activities. Can I yeah, jump in thanks, really Dave. quickly? Excuse me, Scott, sorry. There was a question that came in that actually might help us as the discussion continues. And that okay. is, what is Cayuse? What does that mean? Okay, so Cayuse is actually the name of our, um, it, it's actually the name of our, of our software program that, that we subscribe to. Uh, to it's, it's our uh, proposal, um, it's our proposal warehouse, basically. Um, we utilize it to manage all of our proposals as well as it, it, it has a built-in um, uh, routing system in it so that your proposal gets created and, and uploaded into Cayuse. It's a, it's internal to ISU only, but it gets uploaded and created or created and uploaded into Cayuse. Um, and then when we're when you as the PI have worked with us or whatever the case might be, there's a mechanism within there that it would route it through campus for the proper approvals, um, such as then it would go to you know, once a PI uh, signs off on it, says it's ready to go, the PI certifies that everything in that proposal is accurate to their, to the, to the best of their knowledge. Uh, it then goes to the department chair, the dean, and the university business officer. And then once those approvals are in place for each of the PIs and or the co-PIs, co then it would come to our office for final review and approval and then submission to the funding agency. And I think maybe, Dave, the best way to think about Cayuse is it's, it's the, the, modern alternative to the old days in which we walked around office to office all over campus and got signatures on forms. So really that from a, a PI perspective, it's just what you enter your information into and it allows Dave's yeah. shop to move uh, the proposal through the process. Yeah. And what, what I would also say about the, the work that Dave and his team do um, in sponsored programs is they're really great to work with. Everything that Dave just told you, if you haven't done this before, may seem very confusing and overwhelming. Just drop them an email or give them a call, yeah. Yeah. right? And they will walk you through gently because what Dave condensed there in 10 minutes was really a process that will play out step by step by step as you go along. And I wanted Dave to go first so you know, if you need help finding um, places to submit grant proposals, they've got a system in place to help you do that, right? right? Uh, so there's just a whole bunch of things that that office can do for you. And, you know, but, but most importantly, if you're going to go outside of the university to try to seek funding for your intellectual endeavors, please work with Dave's office because otherwise you run into all kinds of sticky wickets. Exactly. And, and, and one thing that, that um, I wanted to mention as well, and it might have answered some of that, but, um, but just, just good information to have. We've, we recently, uh, late last last calendar year, we we launched a, a a new initiative, and so you know, in in the new world of of the new normal, I should say, you know, we're now we're all all um, uh, thirty nine of us are meeting together in a in a virtual room. Um, we've we've started a and created a, a series of uh, videos, basically that that we've uploaded to the research the Office for Research channel on YouTube of you know, how to walk through Cayuse and, you know, what our office does. And, and when we, you know, we've got a couple of them uploaded there now, and we're always trying to, to uh, work on another one as time permits. And so as you, if you uh, run out to the office uh, for spon office of sponsored programs website, you can find the link to our, our uh, YouTube channel and, and subscribe to that. And anytime the new ones go up, um, you know, we'll, uh, it'll notify you, but but they're just little tools that you might be able to look at and say, okay, yeah, I remember how to do that now. And, and it does take you step by step. And we've got screenshots of each of the Cayuse pages and, and whatnot. The, but the biggest thing that I, if I could, you know, impress upon anything is if you have a question, you know, there are no questions that are too small or, or minor, feel free just to give us a call. Um, you know, any of us are available and I, I hate to say it day or night, but realistically, you know, we're, 
we're, we're here to help you all and, and, uh, um, and, and we'll get back to you just as quick as we can if, we, if we're not able to just to take it right then. And so, you know, right. when we're all physically back together, we're located in room 142 of the admin building. But if not, you know, we're all on our cell phones or on our, on our email at any given time. So we're more than happy to try to help in whatever way we can. Super. Thanks so much for your time, Dave. You bet. Um, I am going to very quickly go back to this and do that. Um, Fred Parrish, who works basically handles financial matters for half the university, it seems like, uh, is going to speak with us next. Fred's great. And I've just asked Fred to give us a really high level, relatively brief overview of kind of once you get the award, then what, right? And some of the spending things that in his experience uh, may be problematic or that you just ought to know. So uh, Fred, I will turn it over to you. Thank you, Scott. And I will be brief because um... I think the reason people are here is to listen to your presentation about how to get grants, not hear me talk about how to manage them once they're here. Um, but as Dave mentioned, well, so I'm Fred Parrish. I've been the business officer for the Office for Research for most of the last 10 years um, and am the business officer for the College of Science and Engineering as well, which is a very convenient overlap um, given the volume of research activity that happens in that college. So that's where I come from on this stuff. <clears throat> um, once you, as Dave already mentioned, the, the post-award operation, the grants and contracts accountants, that's actually part of Dave's uh, shop. Um, once you get an award, you'll and you get your notification that you've received the award, however your agency gives that, then there's a contract that has to be signed. So that contract is gonna come in to the sponsored projects organization and there are people there who are gonna manage that. It's not something that you need to be wondering, oh man, where's my contract, right? That's gonna come in. And then there's a process whereby you will, uh, give your approval for the contract. As Dave said, you don't sign the contract. Uh, an authorized ISU representative has to sign it, but you'll have the chance to review that and approve it before it's signed. And as part of that process for approving a contract, when that's all said and done, and whatever back and forth needs to happen has occurred, you'll have an index. And you'll get a notification that says, okay, this is your index number, your grant number. And this is the accountant who you're going to be working with. So all of the accountants in grants and contracts accounting are assigned specific grants. So whatever questions then you have about the spending on that grant, there's a specific accountant who is designated to work with you on that grant. So um, it's not like a revolving door of different people. There's gonna be someone who over the life of that grant is gonna understand the history and the background. So what do they do? Well, as the PI, of course, you know, you're primarily responsible for the financial management of the grant. You are the one who decides what you're gonna use to accomplish what you're going to do to accomplish the purposes of that research. And no one else is gonna tell you how to spend that. But all of that has to be done within the confines of compliance. So our grants and contracts accountants are there to ensure compliance. They're going to review every transaction that posts to that grant as part of the process of then invoicing the agency so that we can actually get paid because we spend the money first in most cases at least and then we send a bill to the agency who reimburses us so before we can send that bill those transactions have to be reviewed in that process there may be some questions that arise there may be circumstances in which you need to explain 
why some expenditure is consistent with the grant. And you may be told, look, you can't charge this to this grant, either because it's against the specific rules of that agency, or it's not consistent with the budget you know, for that grant, or maybe it's not consistent with ISU's policy overall. So that interaction will happen. So the, and it just kind of, it's not something you need to spend a whole lot of time worrying about until you get there, right? If the thing is set up properly on the front end, we get to the spending and then you work with that. So one of the questions that comes up a lot that I wanted to speak to in the brief time that's allotted to me is, what is the role, as I look at the faces here, there are some people who are in science and engineering and some from other colleges. So it might be a little different, but the question comes up, what's the role of the grants and contracts accountants versus the role of the admin staff or the business office in my area, right? If I need to buy something, who do I go to? Well, that that is generally that frontline management is handled by the unit. If you need to buy something, if you need to arrange some travel, if you need to uh, hire some students, that's all handled by the business office in your own unit. And that varies wildly depending on what unit you're in. Your department might have a financial technician who handles that, might be an admin. Uh, you might go direct to your university business officer depending on how big your college is. But those type of transactional activities are handled within your unit. Where the sponsored pro or the grants and contracts accountants come into play then is if you have questions about what you can or can't do. You know, what is or isn't allowed on a grant? Okay, that's when you reach out to them. If you have questions about where you stand on the budget, you can reach out to them. One of the things that they uh, can help you do but that can also be done by your business office. But if, if you need to reach out to grants and contracts is help you plan for the remainder of your grant. You look at it, um, you'll get a statement every month that says where you're at and you've got a question that says, now, wait a minute, I need to know what my spending plan looks like for the next few months. Our grants and contracts accountants, this is relatively new. They used to not do this, but are now uh, more actively engaged with PIs in helping on the planning side as well, to help you understand not just what you have, but incorporate into that what you plan to do and make sure that all fits together. As for me, the business officer or whoever your business officer is, um, you can always come to me with any kind of question, but you might, be better off going directly to someone else first, right? Because that's likely what I will do is I'll say, well, have we talked to the grants and contracts accountant yet about this? So when do I come into play? Uh, basically when something gets screwed up, <laughs> putting it, I mean, not always, right? I love to get in there and help before things get messed up. But if you're not sure what to do, contact your business officer because it's easier to catch mistakes before they happen than it is to try and repair them after the fact. So if you're not sure what to do, if you're not sure uh, what report you should be using to understand the spending on your grant, if you don't really know for sure who's supposed to book your travel, that's where the business officer function comes in. All of that stuff is my responsibility to, for my unit at least, to make sure that I help you get that done. Um, so I'm the, your business officer is essentially a liaison to grants and contracts accounting when that is necessary. And then a problem solver who can bring together all the various pieces. You know, if you wanna hire somebody, well, there's a lot of stuff that goes into that. There's an HR piece, there's a budget piece, um, there's a sponsored projects piece. So your business officer is there to bring all of those pieces together 
and make sure that you know what you need to do in order to best utilize the resources that have been given to you. So that's where the business office fits in. And, um, and I, I'll open it up. If people have if questions have come in, Miriam, or if anyone wants, anyone wants to ask a question, uh, go ahead and then we'll turn it back over to Scott. I have no questions yet, actually. <laughs> I just got one. <laughs> it says, I'm curious how long it generally takes to set up an award once the contract is in hand from the funding agency. In other words, how much lead time should we build in before the official start date of a proposed project so the clock doesn't start ticking on the award before the money is actually available? That's a great question. It does not take very well. The part that sometimes takes time is the getting the contract signed. The window that lapses in between getting a signed contract and getting your award set up and ready to spend is very short, days usually, maybe a week, depending on you know, if people get stuff signed quickly. That's a very short window. Where that window can be elongated is depending on the agency that you're working with, the time that lapses between you getting an email that says you got this award and the date that that contract actually starts, that can sometimes be a significant amount of time. And it's often out of your control and it's frequently out of the control of our contracts people. We're often waiting for the agency to do whatever they need to do in order to get that contract signed. So it is something that you need to be aware of that any spending that happens before that contract is signed is pre-award spending. Yeah. So pre let's not go too far down in the weeds on that. Yeah. Fred. Um, yeah. Dave, do you have anything to add? Yeah, the, the only thing I would add is, is that, you know, I mean, I, for lack of a better way to put it, all contracts are a little bit different. And so, um, you know, for instance, on, on one of the major funding agencies, NSF, if NSF sends us an agreement, um, it actually covers costs the day they actually send it to us. Even if it takes us a month to get something set up, you know, which is outlandish, but even if it took long, they will cover costs all the way back to the start date of that project. And so we, we just, a lot of it is just working with, is being responsive to requests for review and signature and working with grants accounting and your UBO to make sure that we get things uh, signed and, and back and returned as, as quickly as we can. You know, what, there's a lot of what ifs and we can get into the weeds a lot on that, but. But realistically, I think that Fred hit it on the hit it on the head. Um, you know, we just want to make sure that that we don't commit ourselves to something that we can't cover. Right. That's exactly what I was going to say. Just know what you're doing. You might be able to spend pre award. You might not be able to, depending on the award. Don't go spend it first until you know. And that's one of those things where it's always better. You know, there's some things in life that that you're it's okay to ask for forgiveness, but let's ask for permission in, in, in when we start talking about spending other people's money. <laughs> and there are mechanisms and generally what people, what agencies will do is where this often gets hung up is if there's a rebudget, if there's a negotiation on what the size of the award is. So they want to give it to you, but they want to give you less money, right? Or they want to put, want you to put the money in a different category that can get slow, not so much on our end, but on the agency end. Mm -hmm. Um, and so that's what may get, but that doesn't happen a lot, but it does happen. So just again, once again, we've got, as Fred has indicated, as Dave has indicated, we have a lot of support. I think more than most people are aware of. And so don't let this stuff intimidate you. If you don't know what post-award means right now, don't worry about it. We'll, we'll help you navigate this. We'll help you make sure you stay out of jail. Uh, you know, all of that good stuff. So it's very... It's, it's much more straightforward once you get it done than it is. So Dave, unless you have something else, I'm gonna jump into um, my thoughts on actually getting, so you have to worry about post-award spending. No, the only thing I wanted to add is, a, is a, a real, it's a real short anecdotal situation. In a different college, we were notified six weeks ago that, that an agency was going to fund a project fully. And that was six weeks ago and we got the award yesterday. Yeah. So. I mean, it's just it the feds time. are the feds and they operate on different scales. Some agencies are better than others too, as Dave is very aware. 
Okay, so let's talk about getting there. So again, and I'm going to refer particularly back to Dave's stuff now, but I wanted Fred to talk. Again, don't, don't let this intimidate you because we have plenty of support stuff. Nobody's just going to send you a check, right? It will all be handled through ISU, and we've got a good infrastructure uh, to take care of that. So do, 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 let me make sure I think I'm on the right one. All right. So I've entitled uh, this presentation Insights from the Inside, and that's a reference to the fact that I've been doing this business uh, of research administration for a long time. And so first and foremost, and maybe what's most illustrative from my experiences is I've been an NSF funded PI. I have in collaboration with some colleagues at other universities, a $9 million proposal that is submitted to NSF now. Uh, so I get this stuff from very personal and professional experience and how powerful it can be, even if it's a small award, not a nine million, but a $9,000 award. It can really change the trajectory of your career if you're a graduate student or a faculty member. So I, the, the biggest thing I can do is don't feel like you have to say is don't feel like you have to swing for the fences it's okay to also sub submit smaller proposals, but you know, make sure that, that if you're in COSY, I'm happy to talk with you about my sort of philosophy for the college um, and, and what a good portfolio. If you're in another, another college, you might uh, speak with your dean or others in the college that have some research background. Um, I was an NSF program director for two years. So I was back in the DC area and spent time um, you know, evaluating proposals, providing awards, developing new programs for funding. So I've got that background. And then I have been the chief research officer, the vice chancellor for research at my previous institution and for a year and a half, the, the vice president for research here at ISU. So I've got a lot of experience working with folks uh, to help them you know, make their funding dreams a reality. Okay, this is the other reason to listen and these it's hard to find often super up to date um, information about where the federal funding stuff is, but this is the most recent I could pull up. Um, is the point is, is in, in 16, uh, there were, this is NSF gave 8800 awards by 2018 they gave 8000 awards right that's a big difference. Um, which means that their budget is flat or going down. And so it's a much more competitive environment than it was 20 years ago or even 10 years ago. Um, okay, the other, the next one is um, NIH. And you can see essentially these lines. I know the, the uh, things are a little hard to read, but this is the success rate, which at NIH has now dropped below 20%. And that means one out of five proposals is all that makes it to the fund line, right? NSF is, as you can see, in a very similar territory. So that's having a good game plan for the federal agencies, but for all agencies, nobody funds 100% of anything is very important. And this applies to the internal grants that um, Dave spoke of earlier that we have at ISU to kind of see what you're doing. Okay. Um, all right, so now I was at NSF and my most of my experience comes with the, with NSF. This a lot of what I'm about to tell you is very agency non-specific. So if if you're in the College of Education, if you're looking for funding from some other source, even a, a you know a private uh, philanthropic entity, the Gates Foundation or something, this process with some modifications is very similar to whatever every funding agency does. <coughs> Excuse me, and that's to, first off, they either develop a new program for funding or they revise the RFP and the RFP is the request for proposals. It goes by different things. Sometimes it's ROA, sometimes it's solicitation. Um, sometimes it's a, called a BAA, a broad area announcement, depending on the agency. But it's essentially the thing that tells you how to get their money. Think of it that way. All right. Um, the agency then sets deadlines. In some cases, it's a firm date. If you miss that deadline, the dog ate my homework doesn't work. Uh, they simply won't accept it, 
right? So get it in before time, actually, and we'll talk about that more uh, in a little bit. Um, some some agency NSF has particularly gone to this. <clears throat> have rolling deadlines where they'll have two or three competitions a year, right? But those competitions are on a rolling um, uh, a rolling submission. So you can submit at any time, but when it gets evaluated, depends on where in that rolling cycle. Some people try to game that. They'll just get it in as soon as you have a solid proposal. All right. Um, the agencies receive the proposal. Again, if it's after the deadline, if there is one, you're out of luck. Uh, if there's not, they'll take it. It just may be evaluated later than you'd like. Oops. Oh my gosh. How did that happen? Okay, well, we'll just go through that. I'll back up because it makes it a little easier for me. Um, it's compliance checked. So if it's a 15 page limit, if you go 15 and a half pages, forget it. It's getting sent back, it won't be reviewed. If the font size is too small and there are limitations, they won't do that. If the budget's too big, it'll get kicked back, right? If you're not, if you're a graduate student applying for something that's only available to tenure or tenure track professors, it gets kicked back. And this is where Dave's shop really comes in handy is helping you figure out uh, what you need to do to stay in compliance. Now, there's uh, oftentimes if there's a pre-proposal process, there is a pre-proposal evaluation. And what that is often, NSF has moved a lot to this too, is it's a three to five kind of, here's the elevator pitch for this. And if so, that pre-proposal is very different than a full proposal. You've still got to show the, the subject matter integrity of what you're talking about, but you've got to do it in a punchy way that attracts attention, right? It can't get too down into the weeds. Then for NSF anyway, you're going to have a 15 page proposal on the backside of that, right? If you get accepted, but if you don't get accepted, it'll come back to you. You haven't spent a lot of time and you can talk to the program officer and find out maybe why it didn't get accepted for, for, for a full proposal. So if your pre-proposal is accepted, they'll turn around and say, please submit a full proposal by such and such a date. Okay. Um, then the agencies tend to, and this is particularly at the federal level, they do, uh, for some some uh, for some nonprofits and whatnot that give out grants, they may do this all in house. But for the most part, it's sent out to scientists, engineers, or other or educators around the country for evaluation. Right, and people write in, uh, and then they pull in a small subset of those folks. That, that in the old days would fly to DC and you'd get an all expenses paid trip to DC, which I always loved uh, in my former life because you got to, you know, two days working your butt off. And then as long as you wanted uh, to stick around and, and go to the museums and uh, have, eat good food. So it was, it was awesome. And as we will talk, I encourage you all to find out how to get on into this review process and on one of the panels. It shows you in many ways how the sausage gets made, right? Um, then the program officers or program directors uh, or program managers, depending on the entity that you're working with, make, that, make the decision. And it's based on the quality of the, the science or whatever activity that you're engaging in. But it's also based, particularly at the federal level, on balancing the portfolios. They don't want to give all their awards to Stanford and MIT, right? So they'll say, well, we've got to fund some other uh, maybe smaller schools or schools that are a bit less prominent. Uh, and they balance that portfolio. Idaho is one of 25 so-called EPSCOR states for NSF and some other federal funding agencies, including Department of Energy, including um, Department of Defense. There's a DEP score now that uh, if you are a relatively small state, right, who does not have a history of all the money tends to go to the coasts and a few big 10 institutions in the Great Lakes region. And that's historically where federal funding has, has been concentrated. Um, so if you're here in the beautiful hinterlands, um, there's a program that enables the, 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 the called EPSCOR that enables the program officers to use money from a different pool that Congress has mandated to help fund your proposal. So honestly, sometimes being at a small institution 
can be a real advantage. And, and don't let, this is important, don't let people tell you, well, if you're not at Stanford, Michigan, whatever it is, you're never going to get funded. It's just, it's simply not true. Don't, don't let somebody tell you that and please don't use it as, as an excuse. I have people from all over. I was at the University of Nebraska, Omaha, hardly a, uh, you know, uh, an R1 institution about the same size as ISU. And I had a great track record of getting fund, funded. So it's very doable. It's a lot based on the quality of the, the endeavor that you're proposing and how clearly you articulate it. Okay, and then you, it's an award or decline. And if it's an award, you celebrate and you dance around and, and you open a beverage. And if it's a decline, you probably open a beverage, but you don't dance around, all right? So it's, um, and we'll talk about what to happen if you do get declined. Ah, April, we're having animation challenges. Um, there are operator challenges, one of the two. Okay. So I want to make sure that was agency. Okay, so let's talk, let's hit the negative first and get it out of the way. This is really informative. Those of you who are grad students, who are new faculty, who are more senior faculty, who haven't really been in this process for a while or ever, these are some of the biggest mistakes that we can make. And by the way, we'll share this presentation in a recording. So don't feel like you have to write everything down. I, I'm more interested in you thinking about questions that you might have after I get through this. Um, well, they didn't recruit, re they didn't read the RFP, the request for proposals, right? Somebody wanted them to study, uh, you know, uh, kittens and mice, and they wrote in about elephants and bananas, right? Uh, so you, you got to make sure that your proposal is a subject matter fit. If you try to shoehorn it, you will almost invariably be doomed. Okay, uh, they didn't follow the RFP, right? This sometimes goes to compliance um, in that it's 16 pages instead of 15, or it's not organized in the way they told you it needed to be organized, uh, or you didn't include collaborators when you were supposed to, or you didn't inc include collaborators when you weren't supposed to. There's a bunch of stuff, but this is, again, is where Dave and his shop can really help you to find out if you're not, they're not going to help you with the science or the education or whatever it is you're doing, the engineering, but they will help you make certain that you're hitting your marks as far as the, the request for proposals go. Um, good Lord. All right. I got a heavy touch. Okay. This is a big one, and I'm going to spend a lot of time on this in a few slides. Not a lot, but you know, I'm going to beat it, beat it, um, beat it pretty good is they didn't talk to the program director. Some people read an RFP and they say, oh, well, I got this one. And they write something down and they didn't bother to spend the time talking to a program director. These folks don't bite. There are some funding agencies that, that, that either explicitly tell you not to talk to a program officer, but those are very few, or that you don't get a lot of help. But on the mean, you should make certain that early on in your thinking about it, even months or a year or two years before you're ready to submit, that you talk to a program director that is responsible for the management of that program. On the NSF website, there's plenty of contact information for all of those folks, the same with other funding agencies. So you can find that information and we'll go through how to do that. But that, that's a real killer. If, if, a, if a proposal shows up, and, a, and we look around the room as program directors and say, have you, who's, you know, who's Shelly Smith from Idaho? And everybody looks around and says, oh, I've never heard of this person before. You're already created a big barrier for yourself. Okay. All right, I'm gonna try this gently again. Okay, people wait till the last minute. Now, sometimes the RFPs don't come out until really late. And this Department of Energy is bad about this. Department of Defense is bad about this. So sometimes you don't have much choice but to go quick. But if you've got time to go long, this, this, if it's a bigger proposal, this is probably a six month process, right? Unless it's a resubmission. And we'll talk about that in a bit. So don't wait till the last minute. Um, they didn't contact Dave's shop. <laughs> And so when they get ready to submit, everybody in sponsored programs is like, oh, I had no idea you were gonna do this. And it, it can get too late for them. And we'll talk about that a little bit more. <clears throat> Although they're great to work with and they will respond in an emergency, but, but it's not a good idea to put them in that position or yourself in that position. 
if you need letters of support, if you say, I'm going to use a facility at such, such and so, and it's essential to your project, and you didn't get a letter from the, the person who uh, manages that facility, good luck, because the panel is going to pick on it and say, well, we don't even know if they can get into this place, right? Um, permits, or if you've got collecting permits, as I do as a biologist, or, or other types of permits, um, make sure of that. There's also stuff on the compliance end that, that you can run into trouble with, and again, Dave's shop will help you. <clears throat> if your letters of support, right, when I was at NSF, there were a few PIs who were notorious when they resubmitted their proposals for sending us letters of support that were in a failed proposal from five years ago. Guess what? <laughs> we don't know if the, you know, if that resource is still available to them. So that was a mistake. Um, the other thing is if, if the program officers or the panelists or reviewers look at a proposal and say, oh my God, they're asking for, you know, just a completely unrealistic amount of money. Um, people know that, people pick up on it. Don't pad your budget, all right? Be, do, don't, don't make it too low. And this is something we can talk about at the end. If you make it too low, it doesn't probably make your proposal more competitive, right? They're not trying to buy the cheapest um, item on the shelf, right? They're trying to fund the best project that they can. So get as much money as you need to do it, but don't, you know, no, no new boats uh, for anybody on the, on the grant. Well, unless you're doing a boat grant anyway. All right, um, signs of a doomed proposal. So when, when I, we would see this stuff at NSF, and even when I've looked at internal proposals back in Omaha and here at ISU for the internal grants program, you know something that's got uh, a big doomed or a big failure written all over it from the jump. Um, if it's not well written, if there's typos and grammatical errors, it's a problem. This applies to native and non-native speakers. But if you're a non-native speaker that has not maybe fully mastered uh, American English grammar, then I strongly suggest <clears throat> that you get somebody else to take a look at it, preferably somebody whose grammatical skills is very, very good. Typos are less of an issue now with, with word processors than they used to be. But grammatical errors kill you. And if you're a native English speaker, grammatical errors still kill you. So, you know, don't, don't always get another set of eyes on your proposal for a whole bunch of reasons. And they can be, you know, um, your, your uh, mother or father-in-law, right? Who just needs, they don't need to be an expert in your field and they may fall asleep while they're reading it, but you just need another set of eyes to avoid any just glaring mistakes that will kill you almost right away. Ah. Okay, I got to start using my mouse and my button seems to be sticky. Okay, um, not using the full page allotment. So NSF's 15 pages. We'd see proposals that came in at 12 and a half. Guess what? Never. Because you, it is so, it seems weird. 15 pages of single space seems like a lot. It's not. And if you don't really tell your story and use that entire thing, uh, that entire length, it's it's just inc incredibly rare for anything to get funded. So use, think about what you're writing and use that full allotment of, of space. Bad graphics. This again is less of a problem than when I was at NSF several years ago, but if your graphs are impossibly hard to read or your tables are microscopic, I've got a ton of these things I've got to read. I've got 15 or more as a panelist that I've got to get through. There are 15 pages each with a bunch of other information attached. I'm, if, if I can't read your graphics, forget about it. I'm not gonna take the time. I will not pull out my microscope to do it. So make sure your graphics look good um, in that. Okay, did it again, let's do this. If it's poorly organized, you're pro sometimes the RFP will tell you how to put a proposal together, right? People that have, and I'm not going to go into that much detail because we don't have that much time today. But if you're, if you're, if you don't follow a logical flow, you're telling a story here. It may be a very technical story, but you're telling a story. And so make sure that it's organized, that it reads consistently. This is where other sets of eyes are incredibly important because if somebody goes, "What the hell does this mean?" Right? You probably know that you've got a problem. Okay. Um, if it's full of qualifiers and ambiguous language. Uh, with this funding, I may or may not 
travel to Tanzania to collect wildebeest, right? And that's an, obviously an, a, a really egregious example. But if you're ambiguous in what you're going to do, if you don't project that you're confident that you know what's going to happen, now realizing that you don't always know exactly what's going to happen. So you need to present a case that's, that's almost kind of an if then, right? If this happens, we go down this path. If something else happens, we go down this path, right? You don't want to give the indication that if your first experiment or whatever it is is a no, right? That, oh, well, I've got $500,000 to spend, but I'm not, not a project to do it on. So you need to think about it. Don't be ambiguous. Let them know that you're the expert, right? Don't hide your light. Uh, again, they did letters of support. We talked about that. Um, Okay, now the positive part, a successful proposal. You provide the information that they're requesting. You tell a good story, right? You're writing to the right request for proposals. It's logically laid out. It tells that story. It's error-free. It places the proposed work in a broader context. I'm a, I study parasites in amphibians and reptiles, right? If I just write to NSF, I want to go to us and I've did a lot of NSF funded work in Australia. I want to go to Australia and look at parasites in, in that particular species of turtle. Why, Scott? So I had to put it in a much broader evolutionary and biodiversity context that people that are not experts as in parasitology, but were biodiversity or biogeography or evolutionary biologists could understand why this was important to the broader field of biological sciences. Same thing you need to do. If you're an engineer, write it in a broader perspective about a broader problem um, and, and make certain that it doesn't seem just really niche or really there. And talking to a program director will help with that. We'll get to that. Clearly states the objectives of the proposal. This is what we are proposing to do and why and how, right? This is what we will do with the data that result. This is the statistics that we will conduct. Right? If we're not good at evaluation, at statistical evaluation, we've got somebody on the project, either as a direct collaborator or as an outsourced a contractor that can take care of that kind of thing. It restates the objectives. This one you just beat to death, right? Because remember, in 15 pages, I want to say what my objectives are up front. I want to say them again somewhere in the middle, and I want to reiterate them as I close out the argument, right? And in a way, think like a lawyer, except Anyway, okay, um, it clearly ties the methodology to the objectives, all right? Um, so if, if you say you're going to do something, talk about how you're going to do it, because otherwise, in many disciplines, there is disagreement about what a particular methodology ought to be. And if you don't get that and beat that head on, you, again, will get picked to death by uh, the reviewers on this thing. And it provides a clear, and I like a graphical timeline. Here are the benchmarks of the project. If I get a three-year grant by six months in, I'm going to have this done, 12 months in, ba 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 ba. And it's a, it's a graphical thing that I don't have to read through a lot of verbiage as a reviewer. I just need to look at this and say, OK, I, they've got their ducks in a row, right? I'm not going to pick their timeline to death. I just want to know that they're thinking about a timeline. That timeline is incredibly important. I can't reiterate that enough. Put a time if your if your project and all any any grants going to run out. Put a timeline of some kind in your proposal because it lets people know that you've got your ducks in a row and have been thinking about this stuff and how you're going to get it done and how much time it's going to take. It also serves as a check to you if you realize that it's a three year grant, but oh my god, I can't get all this stuff done in three years. Then you know narrow you know narrow the scope a bit. Get it done. Be able to get it done in three years. Okay. Um, <clears throat> oftentimes there are red flags and these may be methodological. There may be methodological disagreements. There may be things that if your proposal is really dependent upon the success of an experiment, for, an exa for example, and there's any question about that experiment going well, make sure you talk about it if in the event of failure. Because if you don't raise red flags, remember, one out of five of these proposals are going to get funded if you're lucky. If you don't raise those red flags, somebody's going to raise it. And if you don't get out and already have addressed it in your proposal, it will torpedo your proposal. So if 
People ask you questions. If you ask yourself questions, make sure you get out and address that. Addressing a red flag, calling it out and addressing it is okay, right? Not addressing it at all and pretending nobody will ever notice it never happens. <laughs> okay. Um, all right. What can I do to increase my success? Collaborate, collaborate, collaborate. All right. There are some of the junior engineering faculty here in the college. I sent out an RFP from NSF for new folks at, at non-R1 institutions. And I think it's a great program. It is one of the few exceptions I've seen in the last 10 years where they don't want any collaborators specifically. And that's because of the size of the proposals largely. But in almost all proposals from federal agencies, the, even if they don't call for it explicitly, the, the better your team is, even if it's only one other person, it doesn't have to be everybody in their house cat, but for the most part, the better your team is and the more you recognize that you're gonna make your, your project stronger by including big brains that aren't you, then it will be better. So this has been a huge trend over my scientific career of moving from, you know, when I was a graduate student in the late, mid, late, mid 90s, um, there, they were still, NSF, NIH, et cetera, were still funding an immense number, probably predominantly what were essentially single investigator proposals. That just doesn't happen much anymore. You've got to be, boy, howdy, you've got to be really good. And it's really unlikely that you'll be that good starting out uh, unless the, the RFP explicitly calls for it. So I can't emphasize that enough. Don't think you can do this all on your own. Now, if it's a relatively small amount of money, probably you can. But once you start getting into bigger dollar amounts, just, just think collaboration. Okay, work with Dave Shop early and often, right? Again, if you think you might submit something a year out, give Dave Shop a call. Say, hey, I'm looking at this. Can we talk about it? Because they want to start helping with you. Let them put you on the board, all right? In other words, let them put you down that you're going to be submitting in uh, September of 2021, okay? Keeps it on everybody's radar and they can bug you if they're not getting stuff that way. Get your budget done early. Remember the indirect costs, the facilities and administration. This sometimes catches people. If, there, if it's a federal grant or another grant that doesn't have explicit FNA restrictions or exclusions, then in order to keep the lights on and keep supporting research out of the office for research and out of the colleges, we need that money to invest in the future of the research enterprise here at ISU. It's, it's absolutely essential to your success and to your colleagues' success, but it will add up to 42% to the total cost of your proposal. So remember that because if the, the grant is limited to $200,000, that almost always includes indirect costs, which means that, that effectively you've got about $80,000 or less because there's lots of stuff. It's not always that linear as Dave can tell you, but it means that you have less money to <clears throat> get the work done. That can be very frustrating to people. Uh, and I understand that, but it is again, absolutely essential to, our, to Dave's ability and, and the Office for Research's ability to have these small grant programs. It funds some of the other day-to-day -day things that they do in the office. Here in COSI, we use that money for faculty startups for new faculty. We use it for the block grants that I give to support research in all the different departments, um, as well as, as other sort of research investments that we make. Without that money, we can't do it. And then I don't get to give your successors startup funds, which is not, you know, that's no good. <clears throat> Any changes that you have, make sure you communicate. Just be in constant communication with sponsored programs. Anything that changes, budget or personnel or anything else like that, tell them as soon as possible because it may have some downstream consequences you're not thinking of. Um, give them at least five business days to submit, okay? Don't, don't send it in you know, three hours before the deadline and pray. Give them a working week to get every, all their ducks in a row and get everything taken care of. That's essential to making sure that nothing gets messed up on anybody's end. Again, if you miss the deadline, you'll just get it back with no review. <clears throat> and then if you don't get funded, if you get that decline notice, um, keep trying, 
if, if only one out of five proposals are getting funded, it's going to take you two, maybe three submissions of the same idea to get through. And again, you're going to need to work with your program director in the event that it's returned to call them, talk to them on the phone, say, what didn't the panel like about this, right? What were some of the problems and how, how can I fix them? That's incredibly important because if you just make it up and send it back in, at NSF, there was one... Uh, there was one PI who submitted the same thing 10 times and it never got funded because that PI would never pick up the phone and call one of us. It's like, what are you doing? Yeah. So anyway, um, okay. What can I do to increase my success? Contact your favorite funding agency and volunteer, right? They need reviewers, whether they're people who just review one proposal a semester or two a year or something like that. They need subject matter experts. That was my, the hardest part of an NSF program officer's job, right? Is, oh my God, I need to find all these external reviewers. This is not my discipline. Uh, so especially if you're junior, um, if you're an assistant professor or a new associate professor, or you don't have a big history of grant funding, this is a great way to get on their radar. They will know who you are. And it doesn't take you a huge amount of time. And it's very informative about what proposals look like, good and bad. And you can just drop the program officer a letter with your CV and say, hey, if you have anything in my discipline, I do this, give them a short paragraph and an email. I do, this is my subject matter expertise. Here's my CV. I'd love to review a proposal for you or two uh, coming up. I'd be happy to serve on a panel. Um, they will bless you because <laughs> it saves a huge amount of time. By the time I left NSF, I had these lists for the different programs that I ran of people who had volunteered because I knew I didn't have to go bug the usual suspects. Um, so become a reviewer, become a panelist. You probably have to be in a reviewer first before they're gonna bring you into DC, either virtually or in person or wherever it is. But if you're a panelist, it's a lot of work. But in addition to that, that free trip to DC in the old days, you, get to, you do get to see how the sausage is made. You get to see what mistakes panels pick out, and then you don't get to make you don't have to make them yourself. It, that is the single most important thing. Doesn't mean you can't be successful without it, but if you get the opportunity, take it. It's huge. And for those of you in Cozy, it will be well recognized by your dean. So please let me know if, if you're able to do that. Um, <clears throat> make your name known. Talk to people at meetings. Oftentimes program directors go travel to scientific meetings. Um, talk to them there. If there's a chat room in this Zoom environment, get into that chat room and just introduce yourself. I mean, I liked it better when you could just walk up to somebody and chat, but um, it gets your name in their head. It exposes you, right? Um, understand the process by being part about of it, which is just what we've talked about. Publish, but within reason. One, one mistake that particularly junior folks make is they think, oh, if I just take the time that I would have used writing a proposal to get out that third or fourth or fifth publication, then I'll be better pointed. Yeah, but there's an asymptote, right? You get up to a point at which you've got to publish to be recognized as good enough and have a CV to back you up. And then that, that return on publication investment doesn't keep going up, right? In fact, you waste so much time. <coughs> published in another iteration of what you've already demonstrated your expertise at, spend your time writing a grant and then publish after you get it submitted. So, and again, cozy people, I'm happy to help you figure out what that sweet spot is. Um, okay, talk to your program director. Again, I'll hammer this. Now, let's just go into it. This, this is my method of contacting a program director or a program officer or program manager, all right? And this is lots of experiences on both sides of the funding stream that have led me to this. Again, if you don't talk to them, your chances of getting funded go down dramatically. I mean, dramatically, dramatically, dramatically. <clears throat> Write a one page executive summary. Have your in-laws who are not experts as well as people in your department or folks you went to graduate school uh, with, read it, make sure it makes sense to them. It's punchy, it's catchy, but it conveys a deep sense of knowledge of the subject matter area. Second set of eyes, I just said that. Now, 
email it, go to the NSF website in this case, or whatever website you're working with, find the contact information, send them an email, you know, dear Dr. Who's and such. Um, attached is a, a, an exec, a short executive summary about work that I'm considering in applying for name the program, or if you don't really know the program name, the, the organization that they're in, Division of Environmental Biology or whatever subset of, of engineering, for example, that you're applying to um, in, the, the, in, at the, in the engineering division at, at um, NSF. So in the engineering director at, at NSF. And email them and ask for either a phone or a Zoom appointment, right? Half hour, hour, kind of let them drive that bus. Um, nobody likes to get cold called, right? And I, my, my story is that I would sit, be sitting in my office at 4.45 Eastern time on a Friday, and there was a cold beverage waiting uh, in the, the public house downstairs in the building, and I was going to go meet my friends and, and kick off the weekend. And sure enough, somebody in California would cold call me and then want to talk to me about random ideas for an hour. And it's like, oh, man, don't do that. So don't do that. <laughs> Be very professional about it and send that executive summer ask for it. If you don't get a response, some POs are more responsive than others. Wait for a few days, a week, a couple of weeks, and then try back either to that person or usually there's multiple program directors for, for a funding initiative. Email somebody else, right? Because they may be on, that other person may be on vacation. They may just not really like to do that stuff. You never know. Doesn't mean you're got a bad idea. It just means you maybe hit the wrong person for whatever reason. And then develop a list of questions. And I'm gonna give you my suggestions for that list of questions. Okay. First off, is my, pro, is my proposal suitable to your program? Okay. You can talk, when you make this call, you can introduce your project, but they've, they've already read your executive summary. You don't need to beat the dead horse. And you can say, would you like me to summarize my project? I know I sent you the, the executive summary, but you might not have had a lot of time to take a look at it. And then have a short elevator speech, you know, kind of the three minute thesis idea to pitch them the high level idea of what you want to study and what you want them to pay for. <clears throat> Is it suitable? What types of research do you fund? These are really super open-ended questions, right? You're not being specific. Should I use a T-test or an ANOVA? Well, no, that's not their job. You know, big open-ended questions. What makes a successful pro proposal in your program? You're seeing a trend here of really open-ended stuff, right? Are there other programs to explore? Because maybe they don't think it's a fit for theirs, but they know that their buddy down the hallway runs a program that this is perfect for. Do you see any red flags? This goes back to that red thing. Ah, I do because we just funded this type of work, right? Or I do because there's some real questions about the experimental design that I've heard panelists talk about, okay? What's the average size of an award? If you've got a million, literally a million dollar idea in mind and they're capped at 250,000, it's probably good to find that out. Some of that's in the RFP, but even in the RFP, it doesn't always tell you. It may say the maximum award is $500,000, but the program directors are really looking at their budget and saying, we'd like to keep each proposal to around 300. Really good to know, right? Because you don't want to blow yourself out of the water that way. But again, you don't want to consistently under budget. Is there a limit to the number of submissions? Um, sometimes NIH is, is three and out. So if you submit it three times, it doesn't get funded to NIH. Uh, God, bye, you can't submit that idea anymore, right? NSF is much more lenient um, about the number of submissions, but that's key because if you've got a half-baked idea and there is a limit to submissions, <clears throat> bake it a while longer, all right? What else can you tell me about your program or the process? Super open-ended, right? And then that's your list, then you call them, okay? and have that discussion about your white paper. Now, the biggest part to this is, and what I really can't emphasize enough, this is your time to gather intel about the program, right? If you are the guy from California who calls me at 4.45 Eastern time on a Friday and just blathers on about everything, I'm not paying any attention to you, 
right? Except that I'm annoyed. <laughs> That's not gonna affect, if you've got a good proposal, you can annoy me all you want, but it's still not a great idea, right? Just listen, ask those open-ended questions, ask follow-up questions, but don't take them too far down a specific rabbit hole because then you're not gonna get a holistic view. You're gonna eat your time up very, very quickly. So that can be hard for us because we're excited about our ideas. We wanna pitch them, we wanna tell them how great. They don't care. That your pitch, you're not selling, you know, you're not selling furniture, right? You're, what you're doing is getting yourself ready to write a good proposal. That proposal has to sell itself. You're not going to do it yourself, all right? So elevator speech is fine, but then listen. Ask those open-ended questions and really listen to what they have to say. Human beings don't like silence, right? And so we have a tendency to fill silence. So if you can be ready to let them fill that silence, you're going to learn a lot more than if you're rambling away filling it yourself, okay? And then I'm, I'm going to be done. This will go out. So again, don't copy all this stuff down. Here's contact info. It's obviously on the, the Office for Research website as well. And with that, um, I hope, very much hope this has been helpful to you. And I'm happy to answer any questions. Cozy people, if you've got something that you want to set down with me about, summer is really good for that because I've got more time and you've got more time. And I'm happy April Robinson runs my calendar and serves as the other part of my brain. And you, if you talk to April, she will find a time where we can either get together personally if you've been vaccinated and, and feel comfortable or uh, get together via Zoom. Okay, so Miriam. Okay, I do have a question waiting here. Um, and it's, uh, the first question is to what limit is the NSF funding program open to nuclear engineering proposals? I feel that submitting NE topic proposals to NSF is not warmly welcomed, not officially, but the number of words to NE is speaking out. Maybe I am wrong. Yeah, and um, Dan or Amir or Ali, who, or Amir, rather Dan or Amir, if you're the ones who wrote that, I feel your pain. Nuclear oftentimes gets thought of you know, so NSF won't fund, it is, it is you, Amir, go ahead. <laughs> um, if, if NSF won't fund, so an example, NSF simply will not fund by policy anything that's directly related to human health, right? So, because that's NIH's job. Now there are some exceptions on the borderlines, but um, nuclear, I think you're right, it's kind of unofficial on that. I don't know, Amir, the directorates well enough in or, or the, the divisions within the engineering directorate in SF, but my suggestion is look for the one that most closely suits, look for the program at NSF that most closely suits what you want to do and talk to the program officer and just be very blunt when you talk to them and say, I, you know, I think this is a great idea and, but I, I don't, I've heard that NSF doesn't fund nuclear engineering. Can you talk to me about that? So that's my advice there. Okay, and that's the only question I have at this point. Wow, we've been so <laughs> thorough. Excellent. Well, I know that's a lot of talking. I, I you know, if we were in normal times, we would have done this in, um, uh, we would have had an open forum and hopefully by the fall or next spring we can have an open forum and talk about this a little more. This is a bit of a, a difficult situation, but I really do, this is pretty prescriptive and it's meant to be pretty prescriptive. I think it takes you down for any funding opportunity that you have, it takes you down a really good uh, list of things to consider. And again, cozy folks, um, collaborate and everybody collaborate, collaborate with your other colleagues from other colleges, collaborate with people from other places in the country or around the world. And don't hesitate to make an appointment with me and we can talk about your ideas or more about this approach. I actually just got two more questions, Scott. Ooh. Okay. <laughs> the first one, if we think that our research spans multiple clusters within a program, program area, should we contact multiple POs separately or put them all together in a single email? I now, because then you're going to get this, <laughs> right? I would contact, I would look at it, and there are, there are dis the cool thing about a, a, a division spanning proposal on, say, biological sciences, for example, 
is it will go to one of the panels for review. And then when I was there, I would walk across the hall and say, this reviewed really well on our panel. Can you run it through your panel and let's co-fund it, right? And then I didn't have to kick in the whole thing out of my budget and they didn't have to kick in the whole thing out of their budget. It's like, yeah, and both of us got to count it. So there's bureaucracy, right? It's the feds. So that's actually a pretty good place to be in, although it can be frustrating if everybody does this, right? It belongs over there. So call the person that you either know the best or the, the, the program that you think fits the best and say, hey, I realize this maybe uh, spans boundaries. Can you help me talk about who I ought to talk to or where I ought to submit it? And if it might be able to be co-reviewed. Because if they know that coming in, again, this is why it's important to talk. If at NSF, they get a proposal in that they've never heard about before, and they've got to look through it, and you've got to hope they assign it where it belongs. But if you've already queued them up that I'm looking to do a boundary spanner, then when that hits somebody's desk, they'll be, oh, I know that. I think this one should be in um, environmental uh, biology and we ought to share it with integrated organismal systems, right? So it, it's advantageous. Don't spam everybody at once though. You can always walk through and talk to people independently. Okay, next question. Can a graduate student be a PI for a proposal? This is for both NSF and NIH proposals. For very, very few of them. NIH, I forget where they're at with that. For um, doctoral students, Master's students is a really hard nut to crack at the federal level. Uh, there are some programs, um, particularly for folks that are underrepresented in science and engineering for NSF and NIH at the master's level. But PhDs, there's also, there are also those opportunities for underrepresented groups, members of underrepresented groups. But there are also, there's a really good program called the Dissertation Improvement Grant for PhD students. And that's... The, I think all the directorates are still participating in that. And that is a great way to write an NSF proposal that can provide significant support for your work. And boy, when you go out and look for a job, that looks really good if you've got a BDIG on your, on your beta. The other thing for you junior faculty in uh, NSF related fields, if oftentimes DDIG panels are the are places that are great to start with because they tend to go for more junior faculty on those panels. But you can't, as a graduate student, apply to NSF or NIH just for any open thing. You've got to have a PhD and, and almost always be tenure, tenure track. So you've got, to, but again, Dave's, Dave's shop can help you find um, areas of opportunity there. Okay, I have another question. Out of curiosity, NSF really likes fundamental research and does not seem to be interested in, a, in practical or application ready topics. Is there a reason for this? Yeah, it really, that's a super great historical question. Yeah, you're absolutely right. So if you've got a really applied thing, I'm going to find, and this can be a problem for engineers, right? Now, the engineering director, director, it still funds lots of stuff but they're not going to necessarily fund a solution for, and at least Mustafa Mushal was on here earlier, if he's not now, they're not gonna find us, pay you to find a solution for the specific concrete related problem that Mustafa is looking at. They may, however, fund you to develop some more basic principles in how concrete gets uh, manufactured to provide its strength, right? So. Most, most of us are able to boundary span, right? And this, again, is why it's so important to talk to a program officer, because they may look at your, your executive summary and, summary and say, you know, that's really too applied for us. But if you go after this more core fundamental question, then you've got a shot at this. And that's historical. Again, you know, a lot of this funding for, for NSF started out um, in the life sciences, and they very intentionally wanted to create conceptual distance between them and NIH. So NSF's mission has really always been to fund basic uh, research rather than applied stuff. 
we may see that change. There's some pressure in Congress to make uh, NSF, as well as doing basic research, to also give it more of an applied mission, not in the biomedical fields, but in areas like engineering and IT. <clears throat> so uh, with biology, it's really straightforward. And if it's NIH, it's NIH. And if it's NSF, it's NSF. And you got to be careful there. And, and that's obviously what I know best. But, but engineering, computer science are by definition more applied in nature. And so I think it really helps, again, to talk to the PO and find out what that program considers basic versus applied. Great question. OK, the next one. Is it suitable to list service on NSF panels in the synergistic activities section? Say that again. OK, is it suitable to list service on NSF panels in the synergistic activities section? Oh, of your NSF uh, proposal preparation, you bet. Yeah, yeah, that's a that's a super uh, that's a super great synergistic activity. Mm -hmm. And synergistic activities are kind of weird, right? And basically, they they it's it's not going to make or break your proposal. But if you've done things that are not just academic related, um, that are you know helping in other activities or show that you're a broader person, that can give people a positive view of you as a PI. Okay, that's all I have right now. So I'll hand it back all to right. you. Well, hey, everybody, Dave, do you have anything you want to pop in on? We've lost Dave, that's okay. No, I will. No, I think you're, I think you pretty well covered it, Scott. The only thing that, that uh, we might add would be uh, with regards to the synergenic or with the synergy ideas, um, keep in mind that you're limited to the number of those that you can right. that you can include. So, so you might want to prioritize if that's if that's the best one or not. Um, and then, um, with regards to, I know it's probably more in the weeds, but with regards to uh, PIs and who can be a PI, while the agency may require that it be a grad student that that submit the proposal for say these uh, dissertation improvement grants or something to that effect, ISU policy requires that um, yeah. the PI be, a, uh, be an employee of some sort. And so, so the, the co-PI can be the grad student and they'd be included in that, but we have to have somebody that has some uh, responsibility connected to the university with regards to managing the, the, the grant itself. So again, right. it's one of those things we'd answer that question you know, right away when you get a hold of us. Yep, yeah. thanks Dave. All right. Well, if there's nothing else, everybody have a great, beautiful afternoon and what's supposed to be a beautiful weekend. So uh, when we get there, so take care and I'll talk to you soon. Bye bye.